Susan Garrett. I'm chair of the board, and I'm very excited to kick off this important conversation with two of the most well-known and accomplished journalists in our country today. Before we begin, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for supporting ICPR in our efforts to advocate for more transparency, oversight, and integrity in state government. We also want to recognize our lead sponsors for today's event. Northwestern's Medill School of Journalism, Burlington Santa Fe Northern Rail, the Robert R. McCormick Foundation, and Latham Watkins Law. And hats off to the University Club and their staff for accommodating so many of us and ensuring our food is prepared and presented to perfection. Lots of peace in that. We have a lot of ground to cover, so let me begin by introducing our Executive Director, Mary Nero, who will make a few comments. Thank you, Susan. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Mary Miro. It is an honor to join the dedicated team at Illinois Campaign for Political Reform as the new executive director. For over 20 years, ICPR has been the leading nonpartisan advocacy organization in Illinois, steadfast in its commitment to encourage public participation in the government reform process. I'm excited and hopeful as I assume a leadership position here and continue this critical and transformative work. We welcome your support today as we pursue our mission to increase transparency, accountability, and integrity in Illinois government. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's event, Delmarie Cobb. Delmarie is a veteran journalist and the owner of the Publicity Works a Chicago-based public affairs and political consulting firm. Thank you, Del Marie. We are so grateful to have you with us today. And thank you for being here today. Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein first came to national prominence for their work on the break-in scandal of the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate Complex as young reporters in 1972. Their painstaking leg work exposed the investigation and cover-up that would lead to the impeachment and resignation of President Richard Nixon. For their dogged investigative methods, Woodward Bernstein and the Washington Post were awarded the coveted Pulitzer Prize. As you just saw, details of this two-year saga turned into a book and later a movie. They covered every president from Nixon to Donald Trump. Currently, Trump, uh, Woodward is an associate editor of the Washington Post, where he's worked since 1971, and Bernstein is a contributing editor with Vanity Fair. He has served in that role since 1996. There are two better people to discuss the American presidency, how reporting has changed from Nixon to Trump, than our guests today. Let's welcome them to the stage. not going to be that good. <laughs> Enjoy the food. Well, before we uh, start asking questions, I just want to, on a personal note, add something. That uh, I became, uh, I went through my political coming of age in 19, from 1968 to 1972, and you all were partially influential in me becoming, uh, going into journalism and becoming a reporter. And the other person who was partially influential was Michelle Clark, who was the first African-American woman to anchor a network television morning news show. And as you know, Michelle Clark was on the plane coming from Washington to Chicago, and she was killed in 1972. 
On that plane was um, Dorothy Hunt, E. Howard Hunt's wife, and they found $10,000 cash in her purse, as well as Congressman George Collins, who was the husband of Carlos Collins. And so it wasn't until I was preparing for today that I realized that the reason I went into journalism had everything to do with Watergate, because there were two influences, and I didn't even think about it before. So I thank you very much for being here. And my first question along those lines is, how did the two of you come to cover the Watergate scandal? We were at work that day. <laughs> <laughs> it started on the day of the burglary, and I worked at the Post for nine months and covering the police, but I, I spent five years in the Navy. I did not like the Navy. I loved the Post, and so I would do night police work and then come in and do a story uh, during the day, most days. So the morning of the burglary, uh, it was a beautiful day in Washington, one of those glorious days, a Saturday, and the editors uh, sat around and said, uh, who would be dumb enough to come to work today? And, and my name immediately uh, appeared and uh, then they sent me to the courthouse where the burglars were arraigned and there were just so many clues. They wore business suits. Ever run into a He's been, he'd been a little modest. He had been at the paper for about nine months, but he had blazed a kind of amazing trail of local investigative stories. And therefore, uh, the city editor wanted somebody with a particular bent to, to go down and find out a little bit about what this uh, event was in which there were five burglars wearing rubber gloves and business suits and uh, serial hundred dollar bills uh, in, in their pockets. And I was uh, in the office uh, because I was the chief Virginia correspondent writing a profile of a lieutenant governor of Virginia who was running for governor. And I saw all this activity around the city desk and it was clear to me and, and uh, I have, even though I was, I was 28, I'd been in the business since I was 16 and thought I'd been in business since I was five. <laughs> and uh, I saw all this activity at the city desk and I said to myself, this looks like a better story than the one I'm working on. <laughs> and I volunteered to make some calls. And, and after that, we, we came up with a little information the first day. Uh, and the editor said, well, as long as you guys are, are coming up with stuff, you can stay on the story. Actually, uh, what happened, the next day was Sunday, and of course no one worked That's on true. Sunday, <laughs> Sunday, except you and I were the assholes who came in. <laughs> on that Sunday, and uh, that's when we did our first story, which was about the lead burglar who had uh, been, worked at the CIA, was chief of security at the Nixon campaign, which was startling. Yeah, so yeah. So the fact that they had on business suits and they had money uh, made you know right away it wasn't a third-rate burglary, as uh, Ronnie Ziegler, the White House press secretary, called it. Well, I don't, I don't know that they called it that the first day. Um, but it's clearly something of moment had happened. And we were going to try and find out, well, what, what was that? If you think in retrospect, the amazing thing is that the Nixon White House was able to purvey the fiction for many months uh, than indeed most of the Washington press corps believed, that there really was no relationship between this burglary and anything to do with the Nixon White House and the Nixon campaign, even though on the second day it had become apparent that the director of their security was the chief burglar. <laughs> so what, uh, what challenges did you face from not only your colleagues but other reporters at other outlets and politicians and readers? Well, we, the gift to us was uh, that from the editors of the Post, uh, Ben Bradley in particular, and down the line saying, you know, they would call us in and say, where's the Watergate story? Where are you going next? They were uh, more than encouraging. And Catherine Graham, the publisher, supported that and very much had the view, uh, you know, this is what we do. And uh, so we, there, were, there were no restraints on us at all. And of course it was an era 
where we could work a couple of weeks on a story and uh, type, uh, you remember typewriters? And, uh, <laughs> on six ply paper and so we'd make carbons that would go to the editors and we would meet and then they'd ask questions. Uh, now in the internet age, of course, if you have what looks like an intro, a, a very small advance on the story, somebody will come and say, can we get it on the website by noon? It was and would you on television for the newsroom? Yes, it's all about it. Right. Every, every newsroom at major newspaper news organizations now has a studio to go on the air uh, with the cable networks or whomever. And then when you go on television, you can kind of take an extra squeeze Just and jack it up and say things that wouldn't make it into the newspaper or under normal restraints. So it's a completely different media. Let me, let me stop for a minute right there because I think you said something really important. If you want to look at what's going on today with the press, the Trump story, and Nixon, the Watergate story, one of the essential differences is the amplification of the story by cable news especially, and the presence of these reporters from the mainstream news organizations, the Washington Post, the New York Times, uh, AP, Reuters, uh, Wall Street Journal, and the reporters from CNN and MSNBC, but all of these reporters going on the air and talking about their stories. Totally different, so that there is a, a daily uh, drumbeat that goes much farther than the stories themselves that we, we had nothing comparable to that. So we didn't even know what television was. <laughs> to a certain extent. I, I think the first time we went on television was when all the presidents met. Well, well Martha Walters, we did. Martha Walters was the first interview we ever did. So that was almost two minutes. And then her first question was, how much money did you make? <laughs> <laughs> So if um, reporters are going on the air and they're talking about their stories, are they doing the legwork and the investigating that they should be doing because now they're splitting their time and, and of course now reporters are not only covering a story, they're tweeting about the story, they're trying to write the story, they're doing all of that at the same time. And the difficulty is that uh, one of the things Carl and I learned and uh, Carl in particular was the teacher of this. We would sit around and say, you know, no one will talk to us. And Carl came up with the idea, of, let's go visit people at their homes without an appointment. And he got a list of uh, all the people who worked for the Nixon committee and then just we looked up their addresses and we would go see them. This was a novel idea. And uh, people don't do it enough, including us, if I can tell a, a story. Uh, I'm working on a book on Trump now, which will be out in the fall. And I remember that lesson of go talk to people, even if they appear as if they don't want to talk to you. And it was 10 years ago. 11 years ago, I was working on one of the Bush books, and there was a general who would not talk. And so I found out where he lived. Now, when would you go see a four-star general at his home without an appointment? When would you go? The holidays. No, no. You, you. After cocktails. After cocktails. <laughs> the best time to go is 8.17 on a Tuesday. <laughs> because that's after cocktails. And I remember knocking on the general's door. He opened the door and he looked at me and he said, are you still doing this shit? <laughs> on the heart. So I, you know, they teach you, you know, people in the CIA always say, you have to learn to listen and be quiet. So I was poker face. He looked at me and got a disappointed look on his face not in me, I believe, but in himself, because he said, come on in, and sat for two hours and answered the questions. And so we're out of the habit of that. Uh, and working on the Trump book, 
couple of months ago, somebody from the White House, yeah, I'll talk, yeah, I'll talk, when, when. So at 11 o'clock at night, I called him at home and said, uh, when are we going to talk? Oh, yes, uh, we'll do it sometime soon. And I said, how about now? And he said, now? It's 11 o'clock at night. And I said, well, I'm only four minutes away. <laughs> and he said, how do you know where I live? <laughs> and I said, that's not hard. And so I went to see him, and it was not quite dawn before I left. And so we're just not showing up. It's that simple. Too much email, too much phone work. Exactly. Um, Ziegler also, <laughs> Ziegler also uh, called um, you character assassins, and Donald Trump has called the media enemy of the people. Um, what is the difference between the reaction of the public then and the reaction of the public now when they hear that from the White House? I think you have to look at the, the state uh, of the citizenry, the culture. Uh, we're, in this, we're in a cold civil war in this country, a, a state of a cold civil war, in, in which uh, the country and its people uh, are deeply divided with not nearly enough interest uh, on either side of the division of what we've come to call the best obtainable version of the truth. People, big difference between the time of Watergate and now is, and I've got no metric, but I know I'm right about this, that a exponentially larger number of people today are looking for information to reinforce what they already believe, their already held political, cultural prejudices, values, religious beliefs, uh, political beliefs, rather than being open to a contextual, fact-based uh, set of information. And what happened in Watergate is that at the beginning, uh, there was great skepticism about uh, what we were writing, uh, and people believed the White House. It was disbelief. It was disbelief, actually, including by, a lot of, including by a lot of our colleagues in the Washington Press Corps. But gradually, people opened up in a consensus. By the end of Watergate, there was a consensus in the country, in the Congress, that there was a criminal president of the United States. And the Republican Party in particular, uh, there are a lot of heroes uh, in, in the Nixon uh, case who were Republicans, uh, who insisted, Barry Goldwater, the 1964 nominee for president of his party, led a delegation of Republicans to the White House. Uh, after Nixon was refusing to resign, after the so-called smoking gun tape, which established his undeniable participation in, in, in the cover-up uh, of what had occurred. And uh, Nixon thoroughly expected Goldwater to tell him, with his fellow Republicans, that he would have enough votes in the Senate, Nixon, to, to not be convicted in a Senate trial after being impeached by the House of Representatives. And he asked Goldwater, and Goldwater told him, no, Mr. President, uh, and you don't have my vote in the Senate. And two days later, Nixon resigned. Uh, so that's a, give you some idea of how different. Uh, we're watching right now the Republican Party. Uh, there'll be a lot of Republicans on Capitol Hill will tell you their doubts about Donald Trump. Uh, about his conduct, about his lying, but they don't say it out loud. Uh, so we, we've got a different environment today. You mentioned disbelief, and um, we talked uh, earlier about uh, convening of students and the fact that many of them uh, have a skepticism of corporate media. And how dangerous is that? That they're starting out with that preconceived notion that you cannot trust established media. Well, I, I think you want to be skeptical. I uh, applaud their skepticism and look at the facts. But this, but the question here is, and if, if I may recite uh, this example, it was January 1973. We'd written these stories, and truly, they were not believed. We were, people thought we were kind of off on some sort of bender. And uh, Catherine Graham, the owner, publisher of the Post, invited 
us to lunch. Carl, you had to go to a funeral that day, so I went up by myself. And uh, Catherine Graham, I mean, it, it's, uh, she sat there and started questioning me about Watergate. She knew so much. And uh, I was astounded, uh, really blew my mind. At one point, and this is a true story, she said uh, she was reading something about Watergate in the Chicago Tribune. And I thought, what the hell is she reading the Chicago Tribune for? <laughs> And I'm sorry, this was my cheap shot thought. Well, no one in Chicago does. But here she is scooping up all the information. And then she asked the killer question at the end. When do you and Carl think the truth's going to come out? And I said, because after, remember, two months before Nixon had run a, uh, won a landslide re-election victory, 49 states. And... Uh, I said that Carl and I would go see people at home, uh, as was the tradition, uh, after the cocktail hour, and, and uh, people would slam the door in our faces, that there was a cover-up going on, that the Watergate burglars were being paid by their son for their silence, that the investigation of Watergate was really part of the cover-up. So I said to her, I think the truth's never going to come out. And she had this look on her face, pained, wounded, and she said the following. She said, never, don't tell me never. <laughs> I left the lunch a highly motivated employee. <laughs> but it was not a threat. What she said is, look, uh, we believe our sources. Uh, I want you and Carl to keep working on the story we have because it involves the President of the United States. We have a triple, quadruple responsibility to get to the bottom of this if we can. And, uh, and then she asked a, a simple question, why? why? Why do we have that responsibility? And quite honestly, I had no I had no good answer, and she answered it herself, and she said, because that's the business we are in. And uh, I left that lunch thinking, wow, the boss really gets it, is willing to take on the risk. I was 29 at the time, and we've often said, we're gonna put a plaque in the lobby of the Washington Post even though the Graham family doesn't own it, uh, Jeff Bezos does, will do the plaque and will drill it in so hard he can't even get it out. And it's just going to be, begin quote marks, never, don't tell me, never, end quote. Catherine Graham, January 1973. That's journalistic leadership. When you said, um, when you talk about the methodical uh, actions to try to track down people and get them to talk to you after hours and all of those things, um, in a recent story this week, um, the CEO of LinkedIn uh, mentioned that uh, almost three-fourths of all young people uh, have uh, lack interpersonal communication skills. And, and the colleges are finding it, and employers are finding it very difficult to find employees who understand the art of talking in order to get information. And so how do you address that? Because that's what you all had to do. That was the very core of being an investigative reporter. I think it's more than talking. I think one of the great failures of journalists is how lousy listeners so many of them are. That, uh, often our people in our profession go out with a preconceived notion of what they think the story is, seek out sources who they think know something about it and will in a rather easy manner give them some good quotes that will advance the story and particularly advance the idea of controversy, of kind of manufactured controversy. You go see a couple sources on either side of a question and one of them will blast the other. Um, 
my experience has been, and I think Bob's as well, the story's never turned out the way I thought it would when I started on the story. And the reason for that is I've listened to people tell me what their truth is. And my experience is most people want to tell you the truth or at least their truth. And if you're open to hearing it and you don't seek to controvert them right away, uh, if, if you know something that they're lying or whatever, there's plenty of time to, to say that or work it into a context. But I think, yeah, we can do all kinds of tricks, but the first thing is to get in the door and then allow those people to tell us. And so many times by just listening, the story has gone somewhere where I had no idea it would go that was four times better than, as, in terms of the information that I thought I was there. But you figured out, out or, or intuitively where the Nixon story might be going. Tell that story because, and then what our response was to that. Well, you're talking about the idea that, that the Watergate burglary by itself did not make much sense. Uh, here was this candidate, Nixon, who was well in front, was going to win, the, in all likelihood, win the presidency hands down over, uh, over his opponent, George McGovern. Why did they need this break in or get wiretaps or whatever it was? It didn't make much sense. And we got a tip actually, a call from someone who said that uh, this was a guy in Tennessee who was a attorney, assistant attorney general there, and he said, well, he, he'd gotten a call from somebody he'd been in the army with uh, who invited him basically to go out and try to screw up and sabotage some Nixon campaign events. And suddenly that made some sense. And we started to track down who the guy was who had come to visit him. And, and it became apparent, and, and sure enough, the information really confirmed it, that really what Watergate was, was a massive campaign of political espionage and sabotage to undermine the very system of free elections in this country by sabotaging the Democratic primaries so that the Democrats would choose the weakest nominee Senator McGovern, a great man, but not a great candidate, rather than the strongest candidate, Senator Edmund Muskie of Maine, uh, who Nixon did not want to run against. And in this campaign of political espionage and sabotage was funded by a secret fund that we, we had found out about a secret fund in the early days of the campaign. We didn't know quite what it paid for. Well, this was part of it, this massive campaign of, political espionage and sabotage. And they had 50 people working on this, and they did little things to uh, se uh, Senator Muskie's campaign, day in and day out. Uh, Demoralizing things. Yeah, simple things. They had one of uh, Donald Segretti, uh, he was kind of the leader of this dirty tricks operation directed at Muskie. One of them would go out when Muskie would be giving a speech, and uh, uh, they're staying in a hotel, Muskie and his staff, and they all put their shoes outside the hotel door in order to get them shined. Well, this, the Nixon campaign guy would come with a garbage bag at 3 a.m. and collect all the shoes and send them out to a, a dumpster. And uh, Muskie had no shoes, and you, you know, they go, well, Little things, 200 pizzas showing up at the rallies, all of the car keys stolen from uh, the, the cars that were bringing him around. And it was just day in and day out, and it ate away at his self-confidence. And so they decided, they being Nixon and his people, that George McGovern was going to be the nominee. So that kind of drip, 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 uh, every day on Muskie is similar to the drip, 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 drip we got during uh, the 2016 campaign with the WikiLeaks dump uh, in terms of the public opinion. Did you, do you see any parallels there? I, I'm not sure I agree with, with, with the premise that there is something comparable between the WikiLeaks 
dumps and, and that drip, 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 and, and the stories that, that we were doing. I, I, don't, I don't think it is comparable. I think that... No, excuse me, not what you were doing, but what was being done to what Nixon's Oh, you mean the campaign yes, of... Exactly. of uh, well, we know that the intelligence agencies of the United States believe that there was a campaign conducted by the Russians to undermine our elections. And yes, it's really extraordinary that, that uh, some 45 years after Watergate, you would have a presidential election in which a entity, in this case, a foreign hostile power, would seek through political espionage and sabotage uh, to upend an American election. And the degree to which uh, the object was to swing the election to Donald Trump is still unknown. That's one of the things that, that the Mueller investigation is about, and that the FBI investigation is about. We don't know yet, but yeah, it's extraordinary that, uh, um, that but, but what... And what, this is going to be debated for a long time, for years, and in the history books, what the impact of that is. But they did have a role in certain events, or had knowledge. Trump campaign people had knowledge of the dump of WikiLeaks um, emails, and uh, that had an effect. Whether it uh, changed the election or not, uh, it, it's possible. People have made assertions on both sides, and I think, in a sense, we're not going to get the answer. The, qu the question is whether this was Russia or Trump in the Trump campaign doing this? Was there this uh, magic word collusion or coordination? And um, I think factually, we just don't know the answer to that. And hopefully we will, but maybe we won't. And unlike Watergate, there, there's no smoking gun. Well, we don't know. At this point, I mean. We, we don't know. I mean, one of the reasons that, it, that I think it's important that the Mueller investigation be allowed to proceed and, uh, and it's very interesting that Donald Trump has done everything he can to keep this, this investigation from proceeding and that he sought to undermine it at, at every turn and to uh, attack it uh, as being prejudiced and be disdainful of it. Uh, it's actually in the interest of, uh, if Trump is innocent, like he said, he, he should say, let's have the investigation. Open, absolutely. Let only open everything up. Definitely in the interest of the Republican Party to get an answer to that. It is in the interest of people in the country to get an answer to that. It, uh, it there's is. no question there's a cover-up going on. Bob doesn't it's like the word sometimes. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but there's a cover-up. Now, whether that cover-up constitutes a, an obstruction of justice uh, by, the United, by, by the President of the United States remains to be seen. But it's clear from what we have learned so far, for instance, the President covering up and not revealing and indeed trying to deny his own role in the statement drafted uh, by his son for the so-called Trump Tower meeting. He sought to cover it up. Why has Trump sought to cover up so many things that are under investigation. But, but in the context, what's very interesting about this, and we both covered uh, the Iran-Contra affair in the Reagan administration, the Whitewater-Lewinsky business in the Clinton administration, and if you look at both of those investigations, what people were uh, quite a lot of people were quite certain it was going to end in Reagan's resignation or Clinton's resignation, but they didn't end that way, as we know. In Watergate, something very unusual happened. There was clarity because of the Nixon tapes. Thousands of hours of Nixon, you, we will bore you if we start. We know what's on those tapes. And it's he listens to them in the car. Yes. <laughs> I have a cassette where I say, let, let, let's, uh, you know, no more symphonies. Great, great hits. Yes. <laughs> but there are stunning things on those tapes. Nixon saying, let's break in, blow the safe. Nixon saying, 
uh, hey, you know, I know we can get a million dollars to pay people for their silence. I know but we can get wrong. any cash. <laughs> yeah, but it would be wrong because somebody might find out. That's right. Uh, but go ahead, go, go ahead and do it. The other, so there's the clarity of the tapes. And then there is the closure of Nixon voluntarily resigning. I, and I, it, as we sit here uh, it, with the Mueller investigation and other things going on, I just don't know if we can get that, anything that approximates that clarity. Or closure, where people, so it, and as Carl was talking about the Republicans, what's so important to investigate Watergate by the Senate the vote was 77 to zero. Imagine to open, that. to open the Watergate committee investigation. You couldn't get a 77 to nothing vote for the Senate for anything. Even to Today. say, let's uh, keep 50 stars in the American flag. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't do it. And in the end, all the Republicans on the House Judiciary Committee said they would vote to impeach Nixon. So you had a complete turnabout. There was a national consensus about the clarity and the closure. And that there was a criminal president. And of yes. course, what the tapes subsequently have shown, after Nixon left office, because there have been so many of the tapes, and that this would not, not enough. But not enough, right. that's right. But he's, he's got a whole room in his house. <laughs> The tapes did. He, he, he pulls them out and takes them in a car. It's a whole ritual. But uh, that Nixon was a criminal president from the day he took office till the day he left. And that's what we know so, from the tapes. So that not only is there legal and governmental closure when Nixon resigns, there's pretty much historical closure that it's really not open for debate as, as to what, what happened here. And, uh, and again, if you take the context of this cold civil war that we're in in this country, the notion that we could have that kind of closure and clarity uh, seems very elusive. Um, Richard Nixon said that Bill Brad Bradley, once, I mean Ben Bradley once wrote, and I'll read what the quote is, we don't print the truth, we print what we know, we print what people tell us, and this means that we print lies. I don't know if he, if Ben Bradley actually said that, but that Nixon said he said it. And, and since Nixon almost, uh, as you mentioned, the scandals that have happened since Nixon, and there's been many, uh, some bigger than others, um, what is the obligation of the media to get to the truth? Well, it, it, it's absolute, but what Ben Bradley, the editor of the Post, was saying there is we are reliant on our sources. And if somebody lies to us, like if the President of the United States lies, which occurs uh, very often, uh, we have a responsibility to go further and see if there are contradictions, but we have to print what some of these people say. But what I think is so important about the Nixon case is, uh, and we've spent years talking about this, who was Nixon, what was driving him, and, uh, and the question that pulses through this is why? Why would somebody, you become President of the United States, and you figured this out a long time ago, which was, you're president, and then all of a sudden, the goodwill of the country comes to you, and you can do good things. Even people from the other party are uh, very anxious to give you a chance. But the day Nixon resigned, uh, August 9, 1974, he had a reception, or a, he gave his farewell address in the East Room, and invited his cabinet and his staff and friends there. And, and Nixon was sweating. He talked about his mother, about his father. And it was almost a psychiatric hour, televised nationally. But then, at one point, Nixon kind of waves his hand like, this is what this is all about. This is why I called you here. And then he memorably said, always remember, others may hate you but those who hate you don't win unless you hate them. And then you destroy yourself. 
Think of the wisdom in that. He, he got it at the end that hate was the poison. And of course it was the piston driving him and his administration. And that hate uh, is, if you look back on the record here and you say, you know, how did this man become president? How did this happen? But, but now you, you can make a leap here. <laughs> <laughs> about about the current president of the United States. And if you if you go back, and I also I think one of the things reporters don't do enough of is read books sometimes. There is a you know one of the things about the candidates in uh, in the last election, there's some some really good books about Trump, his own books. There are books about Hillary. You even wrote a biography. Which, by the way, yeah. is the best Hillary book. It's uh, very tough, uh, but very balanced, it. if I may but, say. What, but whatever the case, an awful lot of what we are seeing in this presidency, and back to the question of hate and scorched earth and uh, really dismember your opponents, uh, is to be found in, in the literature about Trump. And, but the question is, or one of the questions, uh, uh, there is a, obviously an uh, effort to demean people by Trump regularly. It's not done in private, it's done publicly uh, in the tweets. Whether this is uh, tactical or just an impulse on his part, or whether He's a hater like Nixon. For me, doing this book, I have not answered that question yet. Hate is a uh, very special quality in somebody. And in the end, uh, that's really what did Nixon in. He did destroy himself by hating people. And he did so much. I mean, we get the IRS on the uh, Democrats, investigate those people. Uh, he would, he turned. He took the power of the presidency and converted it to an instrument of personal revenge. In the case of Trump, we do not know that. No, I think that's right. We don't know, but I think we got some pretty good signs. <laughs> uh, speaking of signs, there's a sign in the back that says that we should be letting people in the audience here ask, ask questions. Uh, you can put the sign down now. <laughs> Uh, so I hope that during this, this part of our discussion that you've been formulating some questions, so we're going to open it up to the Q&A, and if you have any questions, we have someone who will bring a microphone to you and so that you can ask them their question. Yeah, uh, Gordon Liddy is providing the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, hi, thank you so much for being here and for all of your work over the years. Uh, can you put in historical uh, perspective whether leaking has changed from one era to the present? Leaking? Uh, I don't even like the word. Yeah. I, 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 when, when the New York Times has a good story, it's a leak. That's right. And when <laughs> we have a good story in the Washington Post, it's aggressive. Hard, it's hard earned. It's <laughs> But the, you know, the idea that, that reporters are just sort of sitting there snoozing at their desks waiting for somebody to throw a bunch of documents over the transom, uh, it certainly never happened to us in Watergate. It rarely occurs, I believe. Uh, and that most of the terrific stories, look, I think we have seen two things in, in the Trump presidency and the reporting on the Trump presidency. The first is a renaissance, maybe the greatest reporting on a presidency by the greatest number of mainstream news organizations that, that I've seen in, in my lifetime, the Washington Post, the New York Times, Rupert Murdoch's Wall Street Journal, Reuters, the AP, Mother Jones, CNN, great, great stories, uh, which is why we know in many cases as much as we do about uh, what this presidency and this president may uh, have done and what might be involved with the Russians, et cetera, et cetera, and all kinds of things that have occurred in this presidency. But those stories in which reporters have talked, particularly to people in the White House, there are 
huge number of White House sources for a lot of these stories we've been reading. Some stories come with uh, reporters have been able to get to some of the lawyers for some of the people who lawyered up in this. Uh, they're all, they're so, but they're working for these stories. They're not too often that people are picking up the phone. There, there is some of it picking up the phone and, and saying, hey, you won't believe what happened today in the West Wing. There's, there's a little bit of that. But also, and Bob makes this point, and I think it's really important in terms of his body of work uh, about the presidency and successive books about presidents of the United States. He has had the luxury of time to spend months and months digging deep and the news institutions do not do that enough. Uh, that we're still looking toward a daily deadline or a weekly deadline or even a report a month off. That there are times that call for taking five, six, two, one reporter, but I think these work very well, and saying, guys, women, the group of you, Let's see where you are in two months. And, and let's get together then and see where this story really goes. And we're going to give you the resources. We're going to give you the luxury of time. The, the reporters who have produced these great stories that I'm talking about uh, have not had that luxury. And, uh, and we don't, we would know a lot more, I think, if our news institutions did that. So as we sit here right now, um, we, there was a report that was released today by uh, Michael Horowitz, the uh, in Inspector General for the Department of Justice, and it's a report on the uh, Hillary Clinton's emails. Um, many say that um, the president will use the results of the report to his benefit, no matter what, what the report says, and that he will try to tie it into Russia even though there's no connection. What do you believe um, in terms of this president? How do you rank this president in terms of how he's able, the skill he has to conflate issues, to come to the conclusion he wants his supporters to believe? Well, he uses everything, uh, no question. I think most politicians do, but he uses it uh, in a very different, uh, aggressive, and sometimes uh, very demeaning way. And I think that's, uh, you know, that, that, that's, lots of people like it, lots of people hate it, but it's, it's now our politics. Let's face it, um, you know, I'm not sure when we're going back to the uh, other approach. Uh, I, I, but I also think that we've got to, in the news business, uh, do what's the hardest thing to do, and that is be introspective about ourselves. And if you, I, I don't know that you want to take a poll here, but this is not a very representative group. Uh, but if you go out and talk, as Carl and I do, to hundreds or even thousands of people and take a poll, how many people basically distrust the media? It's uh, between 20 and 60 percent people distrust the media. I talk to a group of very prominent lawyers and ask that question, and half of the lawyers raise their hand and say <laughs> they basically distrust the news media. So we've got a product that needs to be better. Carl is exactly right. The way you make that better is time against the problem, not this kind of um, tweeting or going on television and doing some of these things, but really uh, digging in. And if you look at Fox News on the right or MSNBC, CNN, on, more on the left, there is among some reporters and, and commentators on both sides, there's a kind of smugness and self-satisfaction of, ah, this is the, we found the truth. This is the only way to look at it. Well, we all know there are always multiple ways to look at things, and, or almost always, and, uh, that that, I, I, I find lots of people who are on one side or the other actually don't like this, even when their side is showing smugness and self-satisfaction. 
One thing I think we have to recognize, it, it's a very difficult concept to integrate into <coughs> journalism. And that is that as we have moved away from print, particularly as the model, and more and more of our information comes uh, particularly from television in one form or another, not to speak of, of the internet as well, social media, etc. But there, there is this question about how far do journalists go, and some of it is good that, that we have journalists talking about stories in an interpretive way. I think we might have been too far on one side of the line years ago. That by being that, too neutral. By being a fiction of neutrality, or the quote, school of objectivity, uh, this notion of 50-50. Well, the best obtainable version of the truth, this phrase Woodward and I have used for many years about what it is we really aim towards, the best obtainable version of the truth. Uh, it's not about a 50-50 equation. If you've got a guy who uh, has robbed a bank and you've got videos of him robbing a bank, and you've got a tape of him confessing to the police, and then the next day uh, he gets up and says, I was coerced, um, and yet you still got a video of him with a gun in the bank, you would think you'd do 90% of your story about the guy with the gun in the bank rather than about the coercion narrative. Takes it to an extreme, but old-fashioned newspapering was an awful lot of that 50-50 narrative. And, and I think it's good to some extent that we now do discuss a little more freely uh, what the news is and what are the meaning of some of these stories that we do. But in the process, uh, it's changed the dynamic perhaps too far the other way. The other, the other thing I want to add that is about Trump and what this interaction with the press is part of it. I'm not sure we've had a president who has sought to be the president of his base rather than sought to assemble a real grand coalition of citizens of the United States uh, so that uh, this is something, even, even Nixon and his Southern strategy and Nonetheless, he attempted to put together a real coalition that went beyond a, a mere base. Everything that Trump does of importance seems to resound to this idea of building the base, keeping the base, and using that as a way of, uh, among other things, having this cultish Republican Party, as Bob Corker called it the other, the other day. So the, there's always been what I would consider a healthy tension between the president and, and the press. Um, I guess the, the question is, with um, President Trump's you know, constant picking at the media, how much do you think media have um, changed how they report on, in both directions? Some people would say when he and Hillary were running against each other that they felt um, more of an obligation to, to report more about her so that they didn't appear, the media, I'm making a you know, broad generalization, but the media didn't appear biased so that they put more emphasis on investigating her, maybe did less of him. To your point, some would argue now that there's um, too much opinion of the media um, inserting itself into the discussion because of Trump. But, but broadly speaking, because he's constantly questioning the press and, and whether they are objective and whether they are quote unquote fake news, how much does that affect what they actually do? Well, it, it, first of all, I think the reporters should be known by their work when they dig into it uh, and explain things or put things into context and provide new information. Uh, uh, Trump, yes, there is that tension, and Trump certainly attacks the news media. I don't think it's particularly <laughs> useful for the media to get in a defensive crouch about it and say, oh yeah, well, we're just, you know, we're First Amendment people and so forth. I think just 
want to be known by your work. At the same time, I think we've got to spend a little time understanding Trump. And, uh, you know, it may uh, never be achieved. We may never understand Trump. But one of the things I found in writing books about eight presidents and now trying to uh, do one on him is something that we, we as people who've never been elected president cannot appreciate, and that is the self-validation of being elected president is, my God, I made it, uh, I rose to the top, and you, if you read the biographies of, or autobiographies of other presidents, they all, at one point or another, land on the word destiny. They feel there is a destiny in this. I think particularly in the case of Trump, because he never ran for political office, and the first time he runs, he becomes president of the United States. It, he would agree with this, he has a large ego. I think in that context, you see him, uh, my God, I did it, I was right, and so there is this self-certainty that comes uh, out time and time again because of that experience. At the same time, I think all presidents have a disease in common, and that disease is isolation. They get isolated. And I think in the case of Trump, it is more isolation because he doesn't want people to come and, you know, he'll say, oh, I want to hear the uh, truth, speak truth to power and so forth. Uh, but presidents uh, rarely like to hear truth to power. What they want to do is hear support. It was George Kennan who talked about the way people respond to high officials or presidents, and he had a brilliant phrase. He said, it's the treacherous curtain of deference that just falls. You get in the Oval Office and there is that sense of deference. So for Trump to, or any president, to break out of that isolation is very hard. I think we need to understand the uh, degree of isolation, the degree to which he is uh, astronomically proud of having been elected president. He, as one of his aides said, he gave the finger to America and won the presidency. <laughs> so, uh, in terms of his ego, um, and all presidents have a large ego. I mean, that's why they think they should be president, whoever is running. But it's, um, uh, it's like Nixon said about if the president does it, then it can't be wrong, or it's not it's not illegal. And Trump has said something to that same effect. You know, that um, I can't be um, I can't be indicted, or I can't. You know, you, you can't find me wrong because I'm the president. I mean, is that come, does that, do you believe that comes out of that ego that they really see themselves as someone above the law? Well, first of all, I, 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 there are a number of things about Trump, uh, including what Bob just said. There also is to go back in his biography and to look at the megalomania uh, that has attended uh, his business life, to look at the way he has done business which is not unlike the way he has done the presidency, uh, to look at the constant uh, lying, uh, which has been part of, of his MO going way back. And this question of asserting uh, his power to do certain things, he has the legal power to do most of the things he's talking about. Uh, he has the to, to power of a president. It is huge. And it's, yeah, it's unambiguous. That's right. It, and it, he presides over the executive branch. He does have the power of pardon. Whether he has the power to pardon himself, that would be up to the Supreme Court, presumably, to decide. Does he have the, the legitimate power to fire the Attorney General of the United States? Absolutely. He has it. Uh, then you get to the question of what's right, what's using that power in furtherance of a cover-up, perhaps, 
uh, what's using it um, to obstruct justice, perhaps? That's a, diff a different question. But the power is there. And, and we don't know the, the ratio without being in Trump's head, which is a dangerous place to be, uh, of, of what, what is his inherent understanding of the powers of the presidency. And one of the fictions, uh, actually, is that Donald Trump has not done a lot as president of the United States. Policy-wise, he has done a tremendous number of hugely consequential acts, uh, executive orders, not to speak of changing the whole dialogue uh, in, in the country. He is a powerful president of the United States, and he has used that power uh, to great, and I don't mean um, wondrous, but in terms of size, weight, to great effect. Yeah. He's used yeah, 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 yeah. He, he has, and the concentration of power in the presidency is so, um, I think it gets greater and greater. Well, particularly as a, as a Congress of the United States is a totally dysfunctional institution that has ceded power to the presidency. And, and, and he, uh, he has taken, how many people remember back to 70, 1978 when Jimmy Carter was president? Raise your hands. Oh, we've got a lot of yes. people from our generation. Uh, one of the things Carter did in 78, he invited Menachem Begin, Israeli Prime Minister, and Anwar Sadat, the Egyptian president, to Washington. They went to Camp David, came up with the Camp David Accords, essentially a, a peace treaty between the two countries, a big deal, clearly didn't solve all the problems in the Middle East. But I remember at the time being astonished and asked Hamilton Jordan, who was Carter's chief of staff, uh, and Hamilton Jordan was obviously a Carter fan, but a Carter realist. I said, how did Carter pull this off? And he said, look, if you'd been locked away at Camp David, for 13 days with Jimmy Carter, you too would have signed <laughs> that, That's true about Carter's personality, but it's, it's true about the agenda setting power that a president has. And you see this, I, mean, I, I see it among my colleagues, you see it at CNN all the time. Trump tweets something in the morning, and that becomes the news event. Everyone chases that and forgets about what happened a day earlier or two days earlier. So there is control that this man has, and he He's also, better at this than any president. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. In he terms is. of controlling and setting the agenda, uh, I, th I think you could argue that, that he's taken the joy out of quotidian life for an awful lot of people. And that all we talk about at our dinner tables and families is, is no, Donald Trump. My, my wife uh, says the dinner table will be a awesome. no Trump zone. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, 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 it's true, but it's very dominant. And uh, we should touch on the issue, one of the issues of the week, uh, Trump's meeting with uh, Kim Jong-un, the North Korean leader, and there's been a lot of criticism about that, that, uh, well, it really hasn't achieved a great deal, it's given the North Korean leader a kind of prominence, and some of that criticism is fair, but in doing uh, the book on Trump, one of the things I found out, uh, which will, uh, last year, I mean, we could have gone to war with North Korea. And that is a pretty scary reality. Whether Trump has handled this brilliantly, or as you said on CNN last night, Trump thinks he has and wants a ticker tape parade already. And, uh, but he initiated this meeting, and it seems to me that that's part of the news that also needs to, in the context of yes, a lot of what we saw was baffling in terms of his behavior there. And at the same time, he brought this thing about where there's now talking going on. Uh, and, and that's, one would think, a 
a real achievement. Yes, uh, to get it's the start of a real get, achievement. It, it, it might, you know, who knows where it's going to go. I, I, I have talked to the generals who have the authority, and this is one of the realities of uh, the modern day. There are, there is a general who has the authority delegated from the Secretary of Defense, delegated from the President of the United States to shoot down a North Korean missile that might be coming to the United States because they realize if they have to bump it up the line, it then they, that it will take way too long. So there is a general I happen to be talking with and he was there with his aide and he had a suitcase and I said, what's the suitcase? And he said, well, that's my communication system to call and order a missile be shot to uh, intercept the, the missile coming in from North Korea or elsewhere. And I thought, boy, I'm glad I don't have that suitcase <laughs> around. But it, it is the reality. And so don't, you know, don't give the ticker tape parade, but uh, so much better. And if you look back at Reagan's meetings with Gorbachev and discussions uh, in the 1980s, uh, there was much criticism. Reagan doesn't know what he's doing. How can he do this? And, I mean, you wrote magnificently about Reagan. I mean, tell him about what the Pope, yeah. of all people. Yeah, I wrote a biography of John Paul II, but a lot of the biography was premised on a secret relationship uh, that Pope John Paul II and, and Reagan had, uh, really to hasten the fall of communism, partly through the Pope and the Solidarity mo Movement in, uh, in Poland being supported by the CIA, by Reagan's CIA, uh, some real coordination. Um, but Reagan was smart enough to understand that this Polish Pope had powers that no other geopolitical leader in the world had in terms of changing the equation between the communist empire uh, and the rest of the world. And, and you, go, you go back to that old Stalin line, how many divisions does the pope have? Well, this pope had enough divisions, and partly through Reagan's perception, uh, to, to really uh, hasten the demise of communism. And then Reagan developed this relationship with Gorbachev, right. which very much uh, mirrors uh, Trump's initial relationship with Kim Jong-un, the, the North Korean leader, and uh, it started out in, in a very uh, clumsy, oh, right. a very clumsy way, but it actually, the Reagan-Gorbachev uh, relationship, along with the Pope and other matters, all kind of um, converged, and, you know, communism went, the Soviet Union went away. An astonishing... When I was doing that book, I, I would go talk to people who had worked for Reagan, and uh, his national security advisor uh, would go into to Reagan with an estimate of Soviet GNP growing 6% a year. And Reagan would throw him out of the office. I said, what the hell are you talking about? They're on their knees, these people. And uh, so I went and saw that. That's right, they're on their knees. And, and so I went to see Reagan uh, and after I started working on this book, and he left the White House by then. I said, Mr. President, all these people tell me how, how you threw them out of their office when they come in there and tell you how strong the Soviets were and that, that they were formidable. Uh, how'd you know that? He said, well, it was easy. He said, I watched television. <laughs> I said, I said well, you watch television? He said, yeah. I said, look, I watch the news every night. And in fact, he did watch the news and he writes about it in his memoirs very interestingly. And he watched the news every night and he said, I watch all those limousines going in and out of the Kremlin. Uh, and I knew that they belonged to the, only to the nomenclatura, the privileged classes. Uh, and, and he said, I also knew that it took the average Soviet citizen eight to 10 years to get a car. And I said to myself, any culture, society, that takes eight to 10 years to get a car is falling apart. All his learned advisors have every reason except that basic fact where common sense prevailed. 
And he was absolutely right. And so, and people wrote off Reagan. This is not to endorse Reagan or no, the presidency by any means, but not hard. It, it, it's very, see, this is, we were talking about this this morning. We, there's an event that occurs in politics or diplomacy or the economy, and then the people in our business then sit around. This has occurred, so therefore we can predict the future. We can't. And the big mistake is leaping from single events or a number of events to say, people will uh, come up to both of us and say, where's the Mueller investigation going? And I always say, oh, I'm glad you asked. I have it written down. <laughs> come on. There are things that are uh, unknowable, and as journalists, we should acknowledge. In fact, it's a starting point. Yeah. That, you know, we're able to get to a certain point of a developing picture. But that's all we're able to do. And, and, and I think one of the things that we do do on television, getting back to Bob's point, is that we go into the pejorative, particularly if we're being attacked by a president, but too often we go into the pejorative uh, and leap to a picture that's already been developed without recognizing that, hey, we're, we're in the midst of something happening here. Let's step back a little bit. And what our reporting needs to be about, this best attainable version of the truth, is, is getting this picture to develop further and further and further and further and become more clarified. So we have one more question. This is our last one. Well, we have a pretty important election coming up in November, and we appear to have definitive information that there was a lot of messing with the last election. I am not seeing very much in the press about the fear of this coming election being contorted one way or another, and I would be interested to know why you think we're not seeing, I mean, I gather that Trump doesn't want to care about it, but I would think the press would be concerned about the possibility of, of problematic issues with this next election. I, I think that's an uh, important question. <laughs> and I think, uh, again, why doesn't Trump just kind of come up and say, this, is a, this was an assault on democracy. Let's <clears throat> put these programs in place. Let's do the following things. Uh, but uh, he doesn't. Now, I think he doesn't do it because he doesn't really believe that uh, the Russians meddled in the election to the extent that it altered it. He may be right, he may be wrong. But I think, because that's the last question, and I wanted, to, I wanted to tell this story that goes way back. September, and, and, and it's under the theme of- You don't know what to You don't mind. really know what's, what something is what the facts are and what it means. So it's September 1974, and uh, Gerald Ford is president. He's been president 30 days, and he goes, went on television early on a Sunday morning and announced he's giving Nixon a full pardon for Watergate. And uh, I was uh, asleep and didn't see this, but my loyal good friend Carl called me up and woke me up and said, have you heard? And I said, I, I was asleep, I haven't heard anything. And so Carl, who has the ability to say what occurred with the most drama in the fewest words, <laughs> said, the son of a bitch pardoned the son of a bitch. <laughs> Even though I was a little sleepy, I was really proud of myself because I got it. <laughs> what he was saying. And uh, I immediately thought, and you thought, ah, it's perfect. It's the final corrupt act of Watergate, that Nixon gets a pardon, 40 people go to jail, and there was an aroma of a deal between Nixon and Ford on this. Ford denied it, but not convincingly. I think Ford lost to Carter in 1976, and Large part Large because part of the cause of the party. Yeah, and the suspicion that, you know, why does the guy, Nixon, who appointed you vice president when Ag Agnew uh, resigned, why does he get to become president and you get the only pardon in Watergate? So 
Uh, this was a, a very uh, deeply felt uh, conventional wisdom. This was corrupt. There was some sort of deal. 25 years later, I undertook one of my book projects, a book called Shadow, about the legacy of Watergate and the presidencies of Ford through Clinton. And I called Ford up and said, I'd like to talk to you. And I'd never met him, never interviewed him. And you met him or interviewed him? No. And, and uh, I said, I'd like to talk about the partner figuring he would say, gee, I have a golf tournament. I'm sorry. <laughs> But he said, no, he was in New York at a board meeting. Come on up. Turned out to be one of the most uh, direct, straightforward people I've ever met uh, in politics. And so I had the luck to be I'm two full-time assistants and excavated what happened with the pardon and why. And being convinced that it was a corrupt act and kept uh, the legal memos kept going back to Ford, I think, six or seven interviews. And his last and interviewed him in Colorado where he had a home, his main home in Rancho Mirage, California. Last interview, I said, okay, um, Mr. President, uh, why did you pardon Nixon? And he smiled and he said, oh, you keep asking that. And I said, well, I've worked on this for months and I don't think you've answered it. And he said, you're right, I haven't. And uh, I said, this is for history. What, what happened? And he said, okay, I'm going to tell you. I've never told anyone, including his wife, Betty. And he said, here's what happened. First of all, a week before Nixon resigned, Al Haig, Nixon's chief of staff, came to see Ford. He's vice president at this point. And Haig offered a deal, said, look, if you promise you will pardon Nixon, he will resign, you get the presidency. And then Ford said, got really uh, self-righteous and said, I rejected that deal, because that was corrupt. I could not do that. We've actually written a story. Yeah, we, we wrote it. Uh, yeah, very we, close to it. Yeah, but just a little bit, yeah, right. just that there was a big agitation in the White House, but never interviewing Ford. And then he said, uh, so I rejected that deal, and I knew Nixon was finished. I was getting the presidency. Anyone ever told you, you know, let's make a deal. You get what you're already going to get, and then you give me something. And he said, I rejected it. And so, of course, I said, yeah, but you pardon Nixon. Why? And then this is the, the you know, these, like you were talking about Reagan, you get to the moment the person making the decision and that person's rationale, which you never get contemporaneously, you have to go back. And so Ford said, let me tell you what it was like to be president 30 day, in the first 30 days of my presidency. Uh, no one trusted anyone. There was so much distrust uh, because of Watergate and Nixon. I kept being asked about Nixon, What's, what about Nixon here, what about Nixon there. The economy was in trouble, the Cold War was still on, and then Ford had a letter from the Watergate prosecutor, then Leon Jaworski, saying Nixon is going to be, uh, he's a private citizen, he's going to be investigated because of the tapes. Quite clearly he will be indicted, tried, probably go to jail. So then Ford said in this plaintive voice, will never be done with Watergate. And then he said, I needed my own presidency. We, I had to act, and the only way to get Nixon off the front page into history was to pardon him. And then he said, that was my view of what the national interest was. And Caroline Kennedy, the uh, daughter of uh, JFK, the late president, called me up and said she'd read this. She and her uncle, Teddy Kennedy, and said, we agree we're going to give Gerald Ford the Profiles and Courage Award at the Kennedy Library, not for being a politician or being president or a Lifetime Achievement Award, but for the single act of pardoning Nixon, an act of courage 
in her late father's book, Profiles in Courage, was about eight senators who self-sabotaged their own careers to do what they thought was right. So there's, I, they gave, had this ceremony, and uh, I did not go to it, but I watched it. And uh, there's Ford kind of beaming uh, some uh, vindication. Uh, and I'm looking at this, and what a cold shower. Because I had it absolutely wrong. I was sure it was corrupt. And it turned out to actually, when you study it dispassionately, uh, it's an act of courage, the exact opposite. You know, 25 years later, now, I mean, humbly. He's also the president without the ego you're talking about yes, because he was never elected. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and he told me, he said, I never wanted to be president. <laughs> I, said, I wanted to be oh, Speaker of the House. <laughs> now, what, the point being, you can't have that experience as a reporter and not say, let's pause with our judgments, our conclusions about what something is, what something isn't, and let it be driven. Now, we can't wait 25 years to find out lots of things, but there has to be some sense of, and I, I say this about the current president, uh, lots of potent, legitimate criticism of him and so forth. But what's the outcome? Karl Rove always said, all these things depend on outcomes. Reagan did three things. Cut taxes, increase the military, and said, or he, his three pledges were, cut the military, uh, cut taxes, <laughs> increase the military, and cut government. He did the first two. And look at Trump. He's cut taxes, and he's increased, you know, maybe a hundred billion dollars for the defense. Now, is that going to work politically? Is are we stable? All of the criticisms, and so I just say, uh, I don't think that's going to be his legacy. Okay, I think you can bet on that. You, you absolutely. There's a lot of evidence on your side, but is. We, but the we picture is the developing. Know. We don't know. The picture, that's the thing about the Mueller investigation. We don't know. And we're going to find out, hopefully. Thank you all so much. Thank you.